Um, two years ago, I think it was, my wife and I spent a week in Mondragon, Spain, at the Mondragon Collective, looking at this, uh, as I recall, $50 billion or whatever it was, this, this massive enterprise, worldwide enterprise in over 100 countries, ten, over 10,000 workers or 15,000 workers, where the CEO makes three times what the janitors make and the decisions are actually made by the workers and everybody who works there owns a piece of, the, of this collective, this cooperative. Is that the sort of model to replace what we described in the first part of this, of the, you know, the guy who owns everything, uh, to replace modern capitalism that you think is the best? Well, yes, I think it has an awful lot to offer us. Uh, to put it in context, you know, Marxism is a very complicated and rich body of, of understanding. It's been contributed to by every culture, every race, every community, imaginable, advanced countries, underdeveloped countries. So it's a very complicated thing and lends itself, like all great things, to different interpretations. The Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, and so on, they made one kind of interpretation. For them, the alternative to capitalism was the state being everything, taking control of the factories and the offices, running everything, planning everything. But there were always other Marxists who didn't see it that way. And it would be folly for us to interpret Marxism or to limit our understanding of Marxism to only one interpretation. To give you an idea of how silly that is, it would be as if I interpreted the Roman Catholic Church by looking at the Inquisition, or Christianity by saying, gee, it was Christian folks who brought the slaves from Africa to the United States, or who fought each other in the most terrible war in human history, World War I. That would be silly and kind of childish. It would be an attempt to dismiss these things rather than deal with them seriously. I think you have to deal with Marxism for the rich diversity that it is. Having said that, let me answer your question. The Mondragon experiment is extremely important. It was actually started by a Roman Catholic priest in the very northern part of Spain, just on the side of the Pyrenees Mountains. Mm -hmm. And he decided at a time of great unemployment that one way to put workers back to work was not to wait for an employer to come along and see profit in hiring them, but to get them together and set up their own industries on the feeling that workers would not only be able to run their own enterprises, they'd be much more motivated to work hard and to work effectively if they directed what they did. They didn't just take orders from somebody else. So they started very small over 50 years ago. They are now a huge operation, as you described it, very, very successful, proving to the entire world that when workers run their own enterprise, when there is no gap between the capitalist who gives the orders and the worker who takes them, the capitalist who gets the output and the worker who has to go home without it, when you break that model, it turns out wonderful things can be done that last a long time. Many of the Mondragon workers are now the children of the first generation of Mondragon workers, and it's a demonstration, and there are many of them around the world, of what is possible when you think outside the capitalist framework. When you say, look, if capitalism can't provide work for people, there are other systems that can and that maybe ought to be looked to to deal with that kind of problem. I think it's a lesson for the United States as well. Yeah, it, it, I'll tell you, it was a, almost a culture shock experience um, in that, uh, you know, having been in business most of my life in this country as, I guess, a capitalist, as the owner of businesses, um, we were, every, all the conversation was in Basque or in Spanish, mostly in Basque, and uh, we were watching an assembly line where they were ma making um, washing machines. And this guy comes along in a suit with a clipboard and stops the assembly line and the four or five workers are sitting there talking with him. They have this long conversation and our translator says, they're deciding tomorrow they're gonna change the assembly line because they're changing the model part or something. Something's changing about the washing machine and he's making notes and they're having this conversation and then he leaves and the assumption that Louise and I had was that he came to tell them how it was going to be and instead what our translator explained to us was that they were telling him their opinion of how it should be and and how it was going to be in fact and then his job was to go communicate it up the line and uh, it was it was it was really quite remarkable if is this kind of thing, my understanding is that this kind of thing is happening big time across South America, that, that it, from Venezuela to Honduras to Argentina to, to Brazil. 
Um, and that there are a lot of cooperative examples in the United States that are actually highly successful that aren't just the local you know, food co-op. That's right. It has a long history. One of the most dramatic examples is in Argentina. They had a major economic collapse about 10, 15 years ago. And it was so bad in Argentina that many capitalists closed their factories, took their wealth, and left the country and figured they may never come back. And after a few months, in some cases a year or two, the workers who were thrown out of work walked back into the factories, cleaned up the dust, got rid of the rust, got the thing going again, and began to run the factories themselves. And they proved to everyone that the workers themselves, if given half a chance, are actually better equipped to fix machines, to run machines, to build the enterprise, it's a remarkable demonstration in a very different context of what is possible in this area. And if we weren't ideologically blinded to this kind of thing, if we didn't need to call it every bad name in the book, but actually look at it as a viable option, I think millions of Americans, if given the choice, would rather work in an enterprise where they were not just order takers, but part of the process of designing and planning and adjusting as they went along. To be a full human being means to exercise your right to design what you do, to shape what you do, together with others. But not always to be the kind of drone or the drudge that most Americans feel they are at the job, which is why they try to get out of working, which is why they try to have uh, another part of their life mean something to them, because the work doesn't engage their faculties. Right. We might be a much happier people if we organized our businesses very differently and took a page from Karl Marx, who talked about this. Dr. Wolf, I, uh, it seems like we don't even have the language to begin the conversation. I was reading an article today um, that was recently published in the Washington Post uh, with a, a title headline, something to the effect of capitalism comes to Cuba. And the article was about how capitalism is coming to Cuba and Castro is going to allow capitalism and isn't this fascinating. And then buried in the article, the actual decree or document or whatever that the Cuban government had put out was guidelines for creating collectives. And so you know, it, it appeared to me from reading the article, and I'm no authority on what's going on in Cuba, and I, I'm, I actually would like to get down there and do some work for that for the next book that I'm writing, but um, my understanding is that it's not capitalism that they're bringing to Cuba. It is this kind of, what's the word for it? Is it collectivism? Yeah, it is. It, it, it's an interesting thing. I read these articles all the time. Uh, for example, in the New York Times, in which capitalism is defined as a place that has a market or that has little enterprises or even not so little enterprises. That's really got nothing to do with capitalism. A market has existed in many uh, societies that were not capitalist. Even in the United States, in our own history, in the slave South before the Civil War, slaves and a slave system was what we had. But they had a market. They produced cotton, and they sold it. And they even had a market for human beings, the slaves, and they sold them. But because it was a market, you wouldn't call that capitalism. You call that slavery. Likewise, if workers get together and build their own collective enterprises that they run collectively and democratically amongst themselves without bosses, without shareholders. The fact that there's a market there is a completely separate matter from this question of how you organize the enterprise. The cutting edge of Marxism and socialism now has to do with changing the base of society, the way we organize the production of goods and services. Because you know, face it, that's what most of us do for most of our adult lives. We get up in the morning, we get ready, we go to work, and we spend our brains and our muscles at the job, five days out of seven for most of us. That is an important place. If socialism, or something better than capitalism, can't address that basic part of our life, it isn't going to be very meaningful to us. And I think Marxists have understood from some of the weaknesses of the Soviet and Chinese and other exper experiments in this, not to go in that direction, but to be a bit more focused, a little less focused on planning and 
property ownership by the state, and much more focused on the, the base of society, where the working people are, where they focus their lives, and to give them a meaningful, controlling, non-subordinated life in that situation. And that's why Mondragon is such an important experiment to have succeeded.